Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Rand Suffolk, Executive Director and CEO of the Philbrook Museum of Art in Tulsa, Oklahoma. With a diverse collection, the Philbrook is known for its architecture and gardens, its community programming, and for its strong exhibition schedule serving over 120,000 people annually. Rand Suffolk previously was the director of the Hyde Collection in Glen Falls, New York, rising to that position after serving as curator and deputy director of the Hyde. Rand has generously agreed to share some of his insights with us, and I'd like to thank you, Rand, for joining us today. My pleasure. Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the Philbrook are, have, have become, over the years, um, connected in an inextricable way. Let's talk about the Philbrook today. Could you describe the Philbrook and how it serves the community of Tulsa? Well, the, we were founded by Wade and Genevieve Phillips, and Wade Phillips was one of the brothers. His two brothers founded Phillips Petroleum. Uh, the foundation of the family wealth was oil. And Waite, while he didn't work with his brothers, he was actually significantly more successful as an independent oil man uh, than his brothers were during their lifetimes. And that really enabled him to build for himself and his family a beautiful Italianate uh, Beaux-Arts style villa, uh, very similar to what other people were doing in terms of adapting historically or traditionally European architecture to meet with Gilded Age American taste. And uh, they moved in in 1927, they moved out in 1938, and they decided that they would donate their home and about 23 acres of beautifully gardened property to what was then known as the Southwestern Art Association, and we opened our doors in 1939. In 1979, uh, Villa Philbrook, as it had come to be known, was placed on the National Register of, of its Historic Places. In 1986, we were accredited for the first time. And then in 1990, we did an addition, about a 75,000 square foot expansion, uh, the Kravis Wing, which really overnight transformed us from being essentially an historic house museum into a modern museum complex with temporary gallery spaces, educational studios, a library, restaurant, auditorium, all of the above. And the, the collection itself has also been assembled over the years, and, and at first quite slowly. That's right. Uh, the Phillips gave us property in the home, but they were not significant collectors, and so we were not blessed with a core collection to begin with. And it's really only been through a succession of angels that have helped us build that collection that we have what we are today. And we're, we're, we're a general art museum. Uh, we're probably the only one in the state that has... Uh, works from the span of Western art history as well as great examples of, of non-Western artistic expression. So um, we're blessed with, we're one of the institutions that got part of the Samuel Crest collection of Italian Renaissance and Baroque paintings. We have uh, an outstanding collection, probably one of the finest surveys of 20th century Native American art anywhere on the face of the planet. We have great Southwestern material. We recently uh, were just given by an um, individual named George Kravis uh, an exceptional industrial design collection. And so that's become an important part of our identity as well. And in terms of, uh, of how this museum is shaped, it's shaped in, in a sense not only being a, a repository of, uh, of this art, not only being a, a, um, a facility that can be used by the community, but also as, as a service provider to the community. Sure. I think that we're, we're, we're a wonderful hybrid. I mean, and, and that's a great strength of ours. You know, people, if we get people through the front gates, I feel like we've got a great shot at making you fall in love with us. Uh, you might come and find something that you adore in our permanent collection galleries. If that doesn't make you happy, the architecture of the villa might enthuse you. you could, if that doesn't make you happy, you go out into the, into the gardens and you'll come into contact with absolute beauty there. If that doesn't strike, you can go into one of our temporary exhibition galleries and find something there. So it's really enabled us to... I think, create a number of gateways into a relationship with Philbrook. And so the big challenge for us has been how do we encourage that? How do we facilitate those relation, that, that relationship building? What does your audience look like? You have 120,000 people walking through your doors. Are they uh, mostly people from the, from the Tulsa uh, environment? Are they young, old, school children? Well, first of all, I can tell you that we've had a really a radical transformation in our audience over the course of the past four years. We've gone from essentially about 98,000 visitors a year to this year we're going to break 140,000 visitors a year. And that is affirming just to see that change. Um, but I think what's more important to us is who's coming through the door. 
For example, we've seen the demographics of our audience based on ethnicity has changed fundamentally. We've gone, this, this current year we're, we're training about 44% of our audience are minorities and people of color. That's up from 41% last year, 38% the year before that, and only 10% the year before that. So for us, out in the big middle, uh, to be able to draw that kind of a diverse audience has been really exciting for us. Well, let's, let's go back 10% four years ago. Right. Now that is a very significant jump three years ago, two years ago, and so on. And it must account for a large proportion of your growth sure. in terms of attendance. Sure. How was the problem of non-attendance first identified? It wasn't as if that sort of came to everybody's awareness or, 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 or was it? Well, I think what happened was when I came to the museum four years ago, between my first interview and my first board meeting, I did what I call my completely unscientific survey. And I asked just about anybody that would listen one question. And the question was, is Philbrook better known for what it is or what it does? I asked people at the supermarket, at the hotel, at the bank, getting my mortgage, trustees, staff, probably close to 60 people. And without hesitation, uh, what I heard was what it is. People said, the gardens are beautiful, the villa is wonderful, and you should go do this one other, go visit this other museum in town. No one ever talked about the exceptional exhibitions that were brought to their community. No one ever mentioned it's unbelievable what you're doing with families or the things that you're doing with children. And that very quickly, I think, began to frame a set of marching orders for us as a, as a museum. And it also starts to uh, set an agenda because if you're known for what you are, you can't change what you are, but you can change what you do. And we wouldn't want to change who we are. I mean, the way I described it to the staff and the board was, we are exceptional as a place, but we need to figure out is how we become essential in the community. We're going to enhance that part of our story. We don't want to not be known for our beautiful gardens and so forth, but we need to earn a reputation for service within our community, for the real work of the museum. And that's what our board and staff have really been dedicating themselves to over the course of the past four years. So your board and staff, going from that, from that question of, of who you are and, and what you do, you then identify an opportunity. W what do you do then when, when you figured out that you're known for what, who you are and not for what you do? How does that translate into a program of action? Well, this might sound a little corny, but I actually developed a model a while back. Um, it's called the Five Eyes of Organizational Advancement. And essentially, it's, it's what I use to kind of take our temperature uh, as an organization. And it's based on the belief that I think all nonprofits, if you're not waking up and going to work every day and reminding yourselves that you're a means and not an end, then I think you're in trouble. You're kind of looking at stagnation at best and failure at worst. And for me to kind of take our temperature, what I, what I shared with people was these five I's, and essentially their invention, how do you create new programs, innovation, how do you take existing programs and make them better, um, inspiration, how do we be compelling in every single thing that we do. All, altruism aside, we're all fishing out of the same pond. Uh, there's only one pile of money there. We've got to be compelling in everything that we do. Integrity, uh, not only in terms of ethics or financial transparency, but do you execute? You know, when you say you're going to do something, does it get done in the time you said, on budget, and so forth? That's important. And so the fifth eye then is integration. How do we dovetail our strengths with the community's needs? How do we integrate our mission throughout and across our entire organization? And what's been phenomenal about this is I can have the silly little model, but ultimately it's about execution. And we have a staff that is uncommonly dedicated to the organization. I think most of the people would probably walk through fire on behalf of Philbrook. And we have a board that is excited about the direction that we're taking and have been incredibly supportive and demonstrated really wonderful leadership. So the five eyes are, are a way to explain an approach to your board, to your staff, and, and it provides you a framework for creating the change. But your first challenge is to define what those changes are, are, are to be and to engage everybody in a program that you can implement. How did you do that? So you, you've got buy-in now to the five eyes. Uh, do you create a strategic plan? Do you, uh, do you develop a, a series of uh, facilitated meetings in which everybody comes together? How did you make that next step? 
Well, we ultimately did create a strategic plan about a year and a half ago. Uh, but leading up to that, I think it was really about, in, in that the board, I think, wanted to give me some time to kind of be there and to kind of figure out uh, what was happening with the institution within the community so that when we did get into strategic planning, I might be able to have an opinion about the direction that we were heading. So they gave you time to, to find your sea legs, right, to, exactly. to understand the community and to, to really understand the various needs. That's true. That's exactly correct. And, and I think, again, we were blessed with such a staff that we would start by saying, okay, let's look at uh, innovation, you know. And so they would start to look at our educational programs. And we took a lot of our traditional offerings and we dusted them off and we tweaked them and we improved them in key areas. Uh, and once that was in place, then we turned to invention and we created three, for example, three great programs that ultimately have become hallmarks of the visitor's experience at the museum. Uh, and along the way, you just kind of remind yourself. I mean, it's kind of funny. Now I have staff that will come to me or make a presentation or something, and if they uh, are asking for resources or something at the end, they'll kind of get a little smirk on their face, and they'll lean across the table and say, you know, Rand, at least three of the five eyes are covered by this if we move <laughs> forward in this way. So, I mean, it is humorous at times, but it does, again, provide sort of a barometer for our progress. And you don't come in and say, Let, let's import these, these changes. You're not coming in um, being um, doctrinaire or directive. It seems like what you're doing is starting off with questions, an, inv an invitation to re-examine, an invitation to perhaps uh, look more critically at what one has done previously. That's right. So you're creating, you're creating impetus for change amongst the people who perhaps had previously acted in a different way. They were doing great work. We were an exceptional institution. But changing our way of thinking, sort of decentering ourselves to look at Philbrook from a different angle and say, okay, how do we become essential in the community? You know, and what does that mean for us? And, and we have a staff that has really run with that and been able to, um, as I said, really execute on all fronts. And is this part of the contribution that, that someone coming in from outside of a community can make to a museum where Without disrespecting the the leadership and the staff of the institution, one asks just different questions. And by asking different questions, you elicit different responses and different thinking. Sure. I think that any time there's a transition in leadership, uh, the person coming in is given an incredible opportunity to kind of look back and say, okay, this is what has happened before. Now it's my turn to try and work with the staff and board to figure out what's next. How do we build upon what happened before that will allow us to do the next chapter of the institution's life. And so, sure, I think that, um, you know, institutions have life cycles. And uh, it's kind of interesting in terms of what we do to be able to step in midstream and kind of find out where things are at and then have an opportunity to work with folks to get us to the next level. Did the changes come more from the staff to the board, or was it more of a top-down, or was it a dialogue uh, between the two? I think the staff really uh, kicked into high gear. You know, they were, whether they knew it or not, I think that they were hungry to start to do something different. I think that they were beginning to feel aspirational, again, as an organization. And um, I think that, I mean, it really has been, most of our progress has been staff-driven. Now, the board has been wonderful in terms of supporting us. Uh, you know, I talked about our n numbers in terms of diversity. Our, our attendance has increased significantly. Our membership during the same time period is up over 20 percent. Um, they're excited about that progress, and I think that they have come to realize that we're beginning to be the museum that they aspired for us to be, uh, and we're giving direction to that. And so that's really affirming and exciting to be a part of. Talk about the composition of the staff and, and, and have the, the jobs of the staff changed as the museum has evolved? Uh, I think to some extent. One of the things that we did was we reorganized the, the structure. Uh, we created a new uh, marketing department, marketing communications department. We created a new curatorial department, a uh, new education department. Those three things were key. We added about um, six new positions to the staff and it had a total of about nine in terms of we had some additional transitions so nine new individuals came on board that was a great infusion of new energy and new ideas that we were able to employ and kind of put in the mix i think for an organization like ours one of our great strengths is that we have staff members that have been there 20 30 40 years 
but we also have this great mix that includes individuals that have been there one or two years, and they bring that perspective. And so there's great balance in terms of what's possible, but also challenging uh, the status quo as you move forward. In terms of, of the programs that are um, offered to the community, do you also provide um, educational uh, type services to your different constituents? We do. In fact, one of the things that we talked about when we were um, hiring a new director of education was that we wanted someone that would lead a department dedicated to helping develop the intellectual capital of the organization. I think in many institutions, the lion's share of that just falls to the curatorial department. And programming is inspired by and is derivative of whatever the next exhibition is or whatever the new gallery looks like. We certainly do that. Uh, that is incredibly important work. But we also wanted a team that would come in and say, you know what, we're going to do some standalone programs that make perfect sense given our mission, make perfect sense given the needs of the community, and we're going to put those into place as well. And that is what we've done. And some of those programs have actually been amongst our most successful. Standalone programs? Yeah. I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, we, first of all, we started taking a look at how we were spending our money in terms of our education budget. And four years ago, we were spending nearly 80% of our education budget to serve fewer than 3,000 school children. Now, as wonderful and poignant as those experiences were for those kids, ultimately, that was not the best way for us to expand our audience. And so we made some changes, and some key things happened. Uh, from back then, we were putting about 2% of our education budget to families. Now, it's probably closer to 50% of our education budget focusing on families. Same with adult program, about 2% back then. Now, it's about 15% of our budget. So you're getting the kids now as members of a family group who can then engage other members of the family group as opposed to individual children within a class. That's right. And, you know, the, the thing about it is, I mean, families, those kids can't drive themselves back. Those kids don't become members. I mean, there's both a missionary and, as someone, uh, Philippe de Montebello once said, there's a missionary and a mercenary component to a lot of what we do. And so we want those families to come back and become members. Right. Uh, but one of the first programs we did was we decided that every second Saturday of the month would be free. And our education department would create sort of a critical mass of hands-on programming for those families to do. And the year before we did it, we averaged about 491 people every second Saturday. The first year, that average attendance in increased to 671. The next year, 920. The next year, 1120. Last year, it was just over 1,600 people every second Saturday. This year, we're averaging over 2,100 people every second Saturday of the month. And 400% more. I work in an art museum, but I'm pretty sure that's the math. But um, and, and that comes from hands-on. Now, when you say hands-on, are you talking about studio arts? Are you talking about interactive learning? Are you talking about um, other activities that just happen to occur at the Philbrook? We have a number of, of programs on those days. Some of them are self-guided. Uh, you can go out in the gardens and do a scavenger hunt. You can go out in the gardens and do, we have some stone rubbings that are placed around the garden. We have um, in our studio spaces and one of our public spaces, you know, hands-on art-making activities for kids to cut and paint and, you know, just have a great time with their parents. Uh, we have some self-guided backpacks that parents can take into the permanent collection galleries or into the temporary exhibition that are self-guided and interactive in that respect. It's really, this goes back to a notion that we have about our visitors being end users. Yes. They're not visitors, they're end users of the museum. So how do we make that experience comfortable for them, accessible for them? How do we let them kind of tailor their experience while they're at the museum? So on that second Saturday, there's you know a half dozen different things that they can do, either individually or collectively. Who's your competition? If uh, someone's going to go someplace, what is the alternative to going to the Philbrook? Is it is it the the ballpark? Is it um, another museum? Is it a performing arts organization, or is it just staying at home and watching the TV? I think it's probably all of the above. I mean, in this day and age, it doesn't really matter where you are. There are such incredible demands on everyone's free time. If you consider the seismic economic shifts that are happening, the unbelievable changes in demographics, if you throw into it the advent of you know new technology every time you turn a corner, uh, flattening of the world, all these sorts of things, we are moving inexorably towards a new 21st century version of ourselves. And for us, we look at the work that we do sort of 
providing access and engagement with uh, what one person has called complex culture as work that's probably more important than ever. And the reason for that is that that access, that, access, that, that interaction fosters cognitive development, it spurs creativity, it engenders empathy, um, it also gives us an opportunity to encourage people to communicate in verbal and nonverbal ways. You know, all of those things put together, that's, that's a real skill set. And I don't think it matters whether we're talking about the classroom or the workplace or even our own backyards. Individuals and communities in the 21st century that are able to embrace that and be successful with that skill set are the ones that are going to be successful in the future. Is fostering those skills also place new demands on the museum director and, and the museum CEO of, of this century uh, that were not required of, uh, of previous generations of directors? I think you're absolutely right. One of the things, you know, that's happening within our profession, and I'm sure many professions right now, is this, this change in demographics. I mean, the boomers are retiring. Uh, I'm a member of the American, I'm sorry, the Association of Art Museum Directors, which is essentially the 200 largest art museums in North America. And we did a study about, studied ourselves about two years ago, and what we found was 66% of those individuals were going to retire within the next 10 years. Yes. And that's happening right now. And we've, tried to take a critical look at developing the leadership pipeline. And a lot of that has to do with cultivating the next generation of curators. But I do think personally that we also need to look at our directors of education. Increasingly, the name of the game is community engagement. And if you have, if you're blessed, as we are, with an individual that uh, has an advanced degree in art history, and at the same time is incredibly capable at what they do, who better is positioned within your organization to understand the notion and the importance of community engagement than that individual is? And so I think as we move forward, those skills will become increasingly looked for um, and rewarded. Does the Philbrook foster uh, cooperative relationships with other Tulsa institutions and other institutions across the country? And could you describe some of those? Sure. We do. Uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, we actively uh, strive to create a culture of collaboration. And probably in the last calendar year alone, we've developed either one-time or ongoing programs with probably close to 25 different nonprofit organizations in our community. Um, one that we're very, very proud of is uh, what we've done in our gardens. Uh, when the world fell upside down uh, economically a couple years back, we made cuts like everyone else did. Uh, we had our director of, not our, I'm sorry, our garden manager came to my office one day and she said, you know, Rand, the plantings in the South Garden are going to be light this spring because of the changes. And what I'd like to do instead is to create a French potager garden and put it there. And I said, that's great. You, you what the heck that? is that? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and she said, it's a decorative vegetable garden. We will design it, we will plant it, and we will take care of it. And then I want to create a partnership with the Food Bank of Eastern Oklahoma and if they will provide volunteers to come and harvest that, then we'll give them the fresh produce. Well, fresh produce for a food bank is sort of like the holy grail. And they came up with about 75 volunteers that would help with the harvesting. And over the two years that we did that, we actually ended up uh, giving more than two and a quarter tons of fresh produce to the food bank. That's amazing. Uh, so that was something that, again, we were extraordinarily proud of and really creative from that standpoint. And, and you also have uh, partnerships with school districts and, and the other institutions of the city of Tulsa? We have ongoing relationships with Tulsa Opera, with the symphony. Uh, we've also worked with our schools. Unfortunately, we, there's a, a real dearth, an inexcusable dearth of arts education in our community. And uh, there are a dozen schools within the Tulsa public school system that have zero art instruction. And we've created a program to try and get some kind of art programming into them. Uh, I think the next step for us will be to develop a teacher's institute. We can't be all places, uh, but what we can do is bring some teachers to the museum, identify ways in which our strengths, again, make sense for their curricular needs, and then whether they're teaching science, math, history, they can take that back into their classroom uh, for us, so to speak. Uh, but we 
we also work with Alzheimer's Foundation, um, Oklahoma's for Equality. It really is about how do we create the best partnership. And it has to be a partnership. Everybody has to have a little skin in the game. In Tulsa, we're kind of the biggest kid on the block. Yes. And so we understand that. And we've got, we're blessed with a certain level of resources, both human and otherwise. And, but we need those partners to be commiserate in terms of their commitment to what we do. And, and it's been um, great because on the one hand, it encourages us to think creatively about our mission in ways that we maybe haven't. At the same time, it certainly exposed us to new segments of our community than otherwise we would have had exposure to. And um, do you also work with the, the uh, arts community, the art-making community uh, within Tulsa? We do, but to a limited extent. Um, you know, it's not better or worse, but that's not entirely our mission. There are a couple other uh, alternative spaces that are currently really focusing on that. Again, it's not better or worse, but we have limited real estate. Those institutions can't go to the MFA Boston or the, you know, Art Institute of Chicago and borrow a Monet. Uh, but that's what we can do. And so that's really where our focus has been. Uh, we've tried in our creating programming that we think will inspire those individuals, that will engage them and look to the museum as a resource. Uh, but right now, that, that hasn't been a big focus of ours, is to, to show regional artwork. Um, we're actually in the process right now of developing about a 30,000 square foot satellite facility in an emerging, an emerging part of our downtown. That space, about half of it, will dedicate it will be dedicated to a space focusing on modern contemporary art and design. What's next for the Philbrook? Well, that that satellite space will have a fundamental impact and add a completely new dimension to the organization. Not only will it allow us to expand what we're doing programmatically. But it also, simply from a physical standpoint, gives us a foothold in a new and really exciting part of our community that uh, we probably haven't positioned ourselves in the past to fully engage. And this will really give us a head start on that. Anecdotally, we're more than hopeful that we'll be able to push people from the satellite space back to the main campus or from the main campus down there. Uh, but Ultimately, there will be three distinct components of the institution. So there will be the main campus, there will be this space dedicated to modern art and design, and then there will be a space dedicated to Native American art, uh, the Atkins Collection and Study Center. So the challenge for us will be how do we enable each of these three components of Philbrook to develop a level of distinction unto themselves, but still be perceived as part of the overall Philbrook experience. This has been an incredible journey that you're ta taking your, your institution um, through with, with your board, with your staff, with the community. I'd like to thank you for sharing your insights with us. My pleasure. Thank you very thank much. You, Thanks so much.